Hey everybody, Tom Lytle here, and this is your first look at the Hicktop AL13-310 3D printer. This thing is a beast, it has a very promising design, but it has several drawbacks, and I will get right into it right now. First and foremost, I would like to extend a thank you to Hicktop for sending me this unit for review. I've been working with them. This is a pre-production model, so what ends up being in the stores may not look or function exactly like this one, and that might be a good thing because there are some design issues here that I hope they will address. But first let's talk about what this printer is for. This printer is designed to be fast, and easy to use. Hicktop accomplishes that by using these linear motion drives to build their printer. They do not use a belt drive like you normally see with the Ender style clones. These linear drive units com are comprised of a stepper motor, a lead screw, a backlash nut, a travel carriage, and an in stop switch, and all the wiring, and it's all integrated into one unit. So this printer is comprised of five of these units and they are all identical to each other and they are arranged in a Cartesian style 3D printer setup. This printer has a dual Z screw setup, dual Y setup, and a singular X axis which controls a direct drive extruder that has an inductive auto leveling sensor built right into it. Ease of use is one of the biggest selling points of this printer. It does not take much to assemble it. It is mostly assembled already when it comes out of the box. You just have to attach the Z gantry to the base and plug in some cables in the back and you are ready to go. Since this design is based on lead screw technology, kind of like a CNC, this machine can print at high speeds the way a normal ender printer would print at normal speeds. So you retain the same quality, but you get much higher speeds. And talking numbers here, we're talking about the default setting for this printer is 150 millimeters per second, and you can print all the way up to 300 millimeters per second. So I printed this big trash can at 300 millimeters per second. I printed this bust right here at 150 millimeters per second and most of the tests that I did were at 150 millimeters per second because that is the default setting in the profile that was provided to me for this unit. Some additional features are you have a modular control panel which is a touch screen. It uses a flexible steel PEI sheet for the build plate. And the unit is designed to read not only micro SD cards, but USB drives as well. The system sports a super simplified user interface. It does not have any advanced controls or any fine tuning functionality on it, which for beginners may be a good thing, but for people like me who likes complete control of their printer, I find that to be a drawback. Another small drawback is the fact that there are no leveling wheels. This build plate is mounted directly to the carriage that rides on the Y-axis, and so I cannot fine-tune my level, uh, and I'm relying 100% on the software to ensure a perfectly level bed. Now my experience with that is that this firmware is not quite 100% there yet, and so it does auto-level the bed, but I find that it does not auto-level it in a way that makes your first layer perfectly level across the whole build plate. And there's nothing I can do to fine-tune that. I cannot fine-tune the auto-level settings in the machine. All I can do is run the auto-bed level sequence and hope that it correctly records the topography of my build plate. But my Experience is for small items, for printing small items, it does a great job um, with your localized level, especially using baby stepping. But for larger items, your first layer um, is kind of suffers and you have to really 
watch it and make sure that it's going to be successful because there are high spots and low spots on this build plate like all build plates have there's nothing that's not a knock against them all build plates have high spots and low spots but this one does not accurately record those high spots and low spots during its auto bed level sequence as far as printing accuracy goes with this printer I, I did do some tests I did some tolerance tests at several different speeds so I started out at 100 millimeters per second and I used this little basic tolerance test that you can get on Thingiverse and I was able to turn the 0.3 millimeter and the 0.25 millimeter space and the 0.2 millimeter gap but when I got down to the 0.15 millimeter gap I could not get it to turn and this is at uh, 0.15 layer height at 100 millimeters per second. The same goes for 150 millimeters per second. I could get all the way down to 0.2 millimeter tolerance, but I could not get to the 0.15 millimeter tolerance. And even at 200 millimeters per second, exact same performance um, down to 0.2 millimeters spacing, which for the speed that you get, that's a I feel like that is an acceptable amount of error and margin that you can get in a print. These prints turn out beautiful. I mean, they look great no matter what speed you run them. You do get a little bit of ringing at the higher speeds, which is to be expected. Even though this thing is a solid unit, this, this whole printer weighs 50 pounds. And as you can see, I have it on my, my pool table. This is a slate pool table that weighs over 1,000 pounds. And this guy, when it's slinging that bed back and forth and this print head back and forth, it's still, I can feel the vibrations through the table. And ultimately, those vibrations do translate to a little bit of ringing in the prints. But definitely nowhere near as bad as if I would try to print at 150 millimeters per second on an Ender Style 3D printer. Let's talk about some of the problems that I ran into while I was using this printer. First of all, the cable management is a mess. These linear drive units here use what looks like a phone cable or a networking cable, and they're very those cables are very short. And so as a result, Hicktop provides various connectors and adapters in order to extend the length of the cables to get them to reach to the back where they plug in, and all those wires end up interacting with each other and interacting with the moving parts. I've had several failures due to the fact that the cables get hung up on the print bed or they get tangled within each other. And so you have to be very careful how you arrange them. There's no real instructions on how to do it. A, a little bit longer cabling would be ideal and um, some type of cable chain or cable management would be suggested, especially for the wires that are used for the bed heater because uh, I can see a lot of extensive wear and tear on that wire already and I know it's just a matter of time before those wires end up breaking. Same thing goes for the extruder cable. I ended up, it just, when you first assemble it, it just kind of lays there and flops and it ends up rubbing against the top rail on the x-axis and you will eventually rub through not to mention the excess motion on these tiny 22 gauge wires that actually feed the connector in the top will eventually fatigue and break over time. My temporary solution is I have a bungee right here and I have the bungee hooked up to the cable and that just holds the cable up out of the way and gives it the full range of motion that it needs in order to do the job that it does. On some of the close-ups you will see um, some layer shifts especially on this bust of Thanos that I have here and those layer shifts were a result of the wires and cables getting hung up on the um, build platform as the print was, run was running. Another issue I had with this printer is that several of the components are hot glued into position. 
They're not screwed in. They're not clipped in. They're just hot glued in. And this printer is built out of components that are not porous, and so hot glue will not stick to non-porous items. The two main issues of note that I had was with the, the print cooling fan, the nozzle fan that's located on the back of the extruder. It's just hot glued in. So the fan was already loose when the, sh when the uh, printer shipped, and it didn't take much for it to fall out of its housing here. And then eventually during this print right here, the fan fell out and then ended up getting torn off by the leads. And you can see me soldering the fan back together so I can reuse it. I fixed it just by inserting a screw. I suspect this is just a simple design issue and I know that Hicktop is working on redesigning their extruder module um, because they do have holes for screws but the problem is the where the hole is located the screws don't work exactly. So I've rigged up my own way to hold this in place and it hasn't been a problem since I fixed it. The power switch is also held in with hot glue and so I don't know how long that's going to last the way it is but right now it hasn't caused me any issues. When I did lose the fan during this print, you'll see that my overhangs ended up suffering and um, the print eventually uh, didn't finish at the top just because it could not print the overhangs because there was no cooling fan for the filament. The only other small gripe I have is that I could not get the micro SD card to fit in the slot or engage the micro SD um, receiver that's inside there and so I ended up unscrewing it and I just have it sticking out the side so I can actually use the slot. Um, the uh, casting of the base is just a little too thick and even with the screwdriver I could not get the, the slot to accept the card and so I don't know what I'm gonna do. I might uh, use a Dremel and relieve a space out here where the slot is so I can get my finger in there and actually push it in it's just a small little thing and um, it's not that big of a deal. A couple other small dis odd decisions made by the design company um, that I don't understand why they do it is first of all I don't know how inductive sensors work. They chose an inductive sensor um, for their auto bed level sensor. When the, when the bed is heated up it will not allow it to use the inductive sensor to, to check for Z. There are Z-limit switches in both of the Z-axis uh, linear drives here, and it uses those to find zero. And so when it, you're zeroing or you're finding home on Z, it goes all the way to the top of the travel, which is about 300 millimeters. And then it's supposed to load the, the map, the level map of your bed, and then come down and find, you know, calculate zero from 300 all the way down here. I think that is contributing to my inconsistent bed level issue and then on top of that the baby stepping on this control panel does not actually give you a numeric readout. You are just hitting a button to raise baby step it up or down and you're watching as it prints to see if it's working but you'd have no uh, way to save your baby steps or have it be repeatable or anything like that. My other gripe as a power user of 3D printing is how simple this menu is. When I say this menu is basic, I'm not joking around. Main, mainly all you can do is control your linear motion and your temperature and you can load a print and that's about it. Um, if you want to calibrate your E-steps, you can't do it. If you want to adjust your Z offset, you can't do it. I feel like if the menu was, if there was an advanced version of the menu, I think a lot of the issues that I had run into with this printer could have been resolved by me instead of having to reach out to their technical support. Um, but at, at the time of the filming of this video, they have no intention on changing their menu. And then you couple that with a touch screen and there's no feedback on the touch screen. And so if I'm watching a print while I'm trying to baby step it to get the perfect first layer, and I'm trying to click on a tiny little plus or minus button on here and I'm not sure if those buttons are actually registering or not because there's no beep or anything to let me know that it has actually accepted my input 
And so these are just tiny little UI complaints that I have that I feel like would add a lot of value to this printer for you know a minimal type of time. So despite the fact that I had a handful of gripes about this printer, I really do feel like it's a solid machine and I think that it is a good starting point for Hicktop to develop something that's pretty amazing. Uh, one of their selling points is that if there is a failure of one of these linear drives, you just have to replace the drive. Once again, kind of lending to their idea of uh, user friendliness. So this is really designed with a consumer in mind, that, that type of consumer that doesn't really want to take apart their printer to fix a component and they would just be more comfortable replacing a whole unit, a self-contained unit. So the bottom line with this Hicktop AL13-310 3D printer, you can print really good stuff with it and you can print it fast. There are some drawbacks, but I'm sure, just like I already have kind of done a workaround with the wiring situation, I'm sure there's ways to work around it. And like I said, this is not a final version. And so I'm hoping that they will address some of these issues before they release the product. It's not released yet. And um, when it does release, I will go ahead and make another small video and try to get some information on any changes that did take place so you can compare what I have experienced here against what they're trying to put out to the public. Once again, I want to thank Hicktop for giving me the opportunity to preview this printer for all of you. Their technical team has been really great. They've answered every single one of my questions and addressed every single one of my concerns and even to the point where they tell me, no, we're not going to do that, which is totally fine because uh, this is their design, this is their machine, and they do have a really good machine and they know they have a good machine here. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what changes they're going to make, what improvements they're going to make to it, and because it can only get better and it's already a pretty good machine. So I want to thank you for sticking around and watching this whole video. Once again, my name is Tom. This is Southpaw Workshop. I'll see you guys next time.